podcasting from the Star Group, home of the iconic Dressable Lions. This is Beyond the Known, the podcast that takes you a step beyond what you know about business. I'm your host, Paul M. Newberger, president of the Star Group. In today's episode of Beyond the Known podcast, we're joined by Ron Humphreys. Ron is the owner of Employee Risk Management Specialists. He's also a safety consultant for us here at the Star Group and is a part of our risk reduction services. How are you, Ron? Great, Paul. Thanks. Awesome. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. I know you've been involved with the Star Group for a while, but you're bringing a lot of value to our organization. So it's nice to sit down with you here today. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. So, Ron, can you tell us a little bit about how you came into the partnership with the Star Group? How did that all start? Well, I have a friend of mine that's also in a safety consulting business, and he and I go way back. And somehow he got connected, I think, with, I don't know, at a convention or maybe a meeting of some sort with my cohort, if you will, and found out that Tim was on looking for a a safety consultant because the one that you had had before decided to take a position with a company, at least the last I remember hearing. So then I was invited in, you know, here to, to have a little chat and It went pretty well because I have known Tim for many, many years. I worked in an uh, insurance company before, EBI companies, and we did a lot of business with the Star Group back when. And so I already had some relationship with him. We wrote business together, and I serviced some of his accounts. So that's kind of how it started, and we had a good conversation, and it was real fortunate that I was able to connect with the Star Group. Yeah, and I guess the rest, as they say, is history. I know uh, based on, we'll get into your background here in a little bit because you've definitely seen a lot. You've been to a number of places. You've got pretty deep experience and skill set for sure. Based on your connections, Ron, there's a variety of insurance agencies you could be partnered with, you could be working with. Why specifically did you choose to partner with the Star Group? Well, you're right. I did, in fact, work with a number of agencies years before But like I said earlier, you know, going back with Tim, as long as I have the relationship that we had with the Star Group, the Star Group truly always stood out. And uh, the reason I say that is because the Star Group had an attraction to customer service, I guess, for lack of a better way to say that. They were concerned about the customer's experience modification, claims history, and, you know, wanting to do the best to help the client prove their safety program. You've got a very unique background in terms of how you ended up doing what you're doing right now. Would you mind sharing that with us, please? I actually had started out working part-time when I was still in high school with a small machine shop. And I've always had an affiliation for tinkering around operating machinery, and I restore cars as a hobby. And one day, the company that I was working with, a small machine shop, was inspected by OSHA. So my boss, who was uh, the co-owner of the company, and he was a great guy, he was like my second dad, took me under his wing and taught me a lot about how to run machinery and repair machinery, and it was an interesting experience. Anyway, when we got inspected by OSHA after he went through that ordeal, he said he was putting me in charge of the safety program. I was pretty young. So anyway, it piqued my curiosity and started looking into what is this thing called safety, safety program and company. What was I supposed to be doing? You know, we used to get safety posters and put them up. That's about all I knew. So anyway, it did interest me. And I started looking, you know, in the paper for job ads for safety people. And lo and behold, there were a lot of companies looking for safety professionals. And it hadn't actually been all that many years after OSHA was enacted. So I started looking at it more seriously and found out there's degreed programs in it. And I ended up going back to school and getting a degree in occupational safety. And I know the rest is history. It's kind of funny how it works where we have plans for our life. We want to go down a certain path, or at least we're aspiring to go down a certain path. But based on people that come into our lives, events that come into our lives, as I know your father and father-in-law both played an important role in your life, especially with respect to where you ended up professionally. Well, they were part of the uh, greatest generation. They grew up during the Depression, and you know they learned how to do a lot of things. They grew up quick. My dad had an interesting history during World War II because he was a tool and die maker. He fortunately got a job through his uncle at a company, and that was around 1935, actually. 
And so he started learning how to operate machinery and doing very well. And when the war started, he was actually deferred from the draft to stay here to help design and build dyes for uh, ammunition. So he had an interesting history during the war. And then when the war was over, uh, he was immediately drafted and then sent to Japan as part of the occupied forces to help in that whole effort. So that's kind of how, I guess for lack of a better way to say it, uh, some of his background, but very mechanically inclined. And again, they taught me an awful lot. Back to the conversation about the STAR Group and some of the services that you provide. I mean, when we sign on an organization with respect to commercial insurance based on the organization, their makeup, and some other factors, they might be eligible for risk reduction service consultations with you. Can you give us a bit of an idea of how those initial meetings take place and some of the things that you discuss in those consultations? Sure. Well, you know, as a star group is uh, fortunate to come together with a new client or even through the prospective client process, I may be asked by the producer to take a look at the company's claim loss report or maybe any other safety documents that the uh, prospective client might be interested in having reviewed. In that way, I'm able to, again, take a look at it from a safety specialist standpoint, say, you know, if we've got a pattern of injuries or something, to toss out questions or suggestions on what could maybe be done to address those. Typically, when the star group joins in with a new client, the producer will give me an email or a talk about safety and they're interested in safety assistance. So then from there, I'll pick up the ball and contact the client and introduce myself and hopefully get a meeting together and where we can talk a little bit more about how I could be of assistance to them from a safety and risk management standpoint. Because of course, some of the things that I bring along would be, again, OSHA compliance, workers' compensation management. I work a little bit with liability, DOT fleet, helping companies with their automobile safety programs if they have people out on the road salespeople, technical people, contractors, and so on. Yeah, and this is one of these things that as an agency, the Star Group is not just turning these organizational clients over to just anybody. Ron, you've worked on some pretty impressive projects in your time. Uh, I know that you were a field safety supervisor on large construction projects, including the Lambeau Field Redevelopment Project, as well as the I-94 Construction Projects. Well, it was interesting, especially uh, Lambeau Field goes back quite a few years, actually not that long after Miller Park was uh, constructed. And maybe on an offshoot here, it's probably interesting to make mention that after the Miller Park tragedy, I saw a stark change in how companies take safety more seriously today since then. And I felt it at Lambeau and on the the various I-94 projects that I worked on. They had a very strict regimen when it came to safety. If you didn't have your safety gear on, your personal protective equipment, the general contractor had a fine system, kind of like a traffic ticket. You didn't have your hard hat on on the site, it would be a $100 fine. That would go to the employee's employer, contractor, subcontractor. Just a lot of uh, attention to making sure everybody was doing things the way they're supposed to, uh, using equipment, climbing ladders, and various things. And there are a number of OSHA regulations, of course, involved in making sure that jobs get done in a safe manner. And that's why they had the safety supervision they had, and they still have that today. Just in fact, on an offshoot, I got uh, invited to work a little bit on the Foxconn project. So, in fact, I'll be spending a short period of time there helping out a friend that's in do, that does the same thing I do. And there is, in fact, even a higher degree of safety urgency than I've seen even on at Lambeau Field. So, that's a lot of what I did. I'm probably missing a few things. Uh, you know, I did safety talks there for the crew that I was responsible for uh, supervising. We'd have to do safety inspections can imagine a lot of uh, high profile, a lot of public interest in the project, of course, being Lambeau Field. And OSHA was on site quite frequently. And it's kind of a lot of what I did. Well, you mentioned OSHA a couple times as you were walking us through some of these big projects that you were a part of. Let's transition to that a little bit, because I I believe that 
There's a lot of businesses out there that feel OSHA is this big, scary, evil nemesis, something to be feared, something to run for the hills for when you hear OSHA, when really they're in place to protect both the business owners and their employees. With that in mind, what tips can you give our listeners to strengthen that relationship between OSHA and the business owner? Well, I'd say, and this is a lot of what I do to help uh, Star Group clients, to help them kind of get a view of what the obligations are, what things do they need to be concerned about, and how to help them walk through the process, you know, of uh, OSHA compliance. Again, more today are doing a lot more than they used to just even a few years ago. But there are some things that clients need to be concerned about, such as, you know, what OSHA regulations do I need to be concerned about? And, And they do vary somewhat depending upon the nature of the operation. I mentioned construction a little bit ago. That's a whole different set of standards under OSHA than, say, under general industry for a manufacturing operation. A lot of them do cross over to some degree, but again, helping the client understand, you know, what are some things that we need to be doing? For example, a lot of companies are required to keep OSHA records. That's what we call a 300 log of injuries and illnesses the company might be experiencing or have experienced. And that's one of the first things that OSHA, if they were there for an inspection or an investigation that they would be asking to see, and you'd want the company would want to make sure that they are able to produce that information because otherwise that kind of can send a bad signal to OSHA that, oh, they're not doing that. Well, gee, what else could they not be doing that they should be? So I don't know if I answered your question as directly or included everything I should, but just in case I haven't, some things to be looking at, as I said earlier, like what type of regulations should companies be looking at, OSHA regulations that they should be concerned about. And again, that varies by the type of business. And there are ways that they can look on, for example, the OSHA website and look up information they call establishment search. Uh, And then they can plug in their, their information like their NAICS code that companies have. And they, in fact, that has to go on the record keeping log And then they can bring that up on the uh, website and see what are the most frequently cited standards for that type of operation or that type of business. So that helps them to say, oh, all right, these are some of the top regulations I need to make sure that I'm paying attention to, among others. So those are some discussions that I find I have in early conversations with Star Group clients, especially if they may not be doing it or if they may need more assistance in that area. The other way to look at that, too, is getting a look at their OSHA logs to review those. Their claim loss runs from their insurance company. And as we look at those types of injuries, they probably, in nine cases out of ten, will have some relevance to an OSHA standard. They're having a lot of, say, hand lacerations. What do we have here that they're handling materials or operating machinery that are causing these types of injuries? And again, in many cases, it may have application to a particular OSHA standard. So at the end of the day, if there's one takeaway for the listeners based on what Ron was just talking about, this may seem counterintuitive to some but OSHA is your friend. One other thing that I want to talk about, Ron, because I do think this is important for our listeners to hear, what should a business owner, what should an organization do, the person who's tasked with safety in an organization like this, in the event of an audit, and, in your opinion, are audits even avoidable? Well, there's a a number of reasons why OSHA would be looking at a company. They have, and most often it might be an injury that's occurred that's required inpatient care or hospitalization, and that can generate what they call an OSHA investigation. There's kind of two things, an OSHA inspection where they might show up at the door and want to do a walkthrough or uh, some sort of a review or an investigation. The process is pretty much the same, but that's the reason they're out there. And then you have, it may be an employee complaint, and I spend an awful lot of time talking with companies about how to avoid their employees contacting OSHA with the complaint because it's really unnecessary if they have a good communication program set up where they can go to their supervisor and say, you know, I have a concern and I think we need to look at this. And sometimes inadvertently they're not 
the uh, complaint or the concern isn't taken seriously for one reason or another. It may be just that it doesn't appear that serious to, say, the supervisor as much as it does to the employee. But I always advise, take that very seriously because I can, can't tell you how many OSHA inspections have occurred because the supervisor or the manager didn't take that concern of that employee seriously enough, and then the employee filed a complaint. The other thing is going back to the uh, OSHA logging and the uh, North American Industry Classification Code, NAICS, that companies have, it, their OSHA can take that data and look at the number of injuries that have occurred, and then they have a formula for calculating or comparing how the, uh, one company's experience measures up or compares against the other in that same code. And if their injury experience is a lot higher than what it is on the average. It's similar to how a premium, you know, your experience modification factor works. Uh, Very similar to that, but you have a high modification or in the case of OSHA data, a high total recordable case rate or DART rate. That's a red flag that OSHA would say, hey, this company is having more injuries than the average. So they may be part of uh, what we call a programmed inspection. So I think I pretty much covered a lot of the, you know, the more common reasons why a company might be inspected. So our audience is pretty diverse. We do have a number of business owners, C-suite executives, people that are in top-level positions within their organizations listening to the Beyond the Known podcast. So with that in mind, what tips could you give these management professionals, these supervisors, to help compel them or to help them compel their employees to comply with these safety regulations? It's an interesting question because I faced a a similar situation when I went back to, you know, how I got into safety when I was working at that small machine shop. I actually overlooked the fact that when I was uh, approached by my boss to take charge of the safety program, I was a supervisor in a department there. So I had responsibility for making sure we got the different orders out and which employee was going to be taking care of what during a particular shift. And the communication that you have with your people, positive, hopefully a positive, uh, mutually respectful communication goes a long way. If your people are given the training that they need to be OSHA compliant, I guess is, is one way to put it, where, they, again, they understand the importance of it for their safety. And their supervisor, the company owner, uh, shows or has some passion for the safety of their people, that they care about their people. It's not just about dollars and cents or, or production, but we want to get things done, but we want to make sure you're going to go home safe at the end of the day. Again, this is a big thing to be talking about in a nutshell, but that to me is one of the fundamental things. If people understand, and and again, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but my I've had some bosses in the past, and I would say the boss that I refer to again that happened to me in charge of safety so so many years ago, and I said he was like my second father. That's because he kind of treated me like a son. And he had a, a, just a way of communicating with people, and, and you wanted to make sure you did your best for him. And if you have any manager, supervisor that can instill that or get that kind of attitude from their people, to me, that's magical. You had talked about the importance of safety, the importance of rules and regulations, because you want these employees to go home safe at the end of the day. And I know that you've had to investigate severe losses that were involving maiming injuries and even regrettably fatalities. And and you did tell us a story, I'll let you tell it, about a young man who was 25 years old. This goes back just a few years ago where a young man at a, uh, a contracting organization probably was in his job, I don't know, maybe a year if that. And he was um, called out to repair some equipment that he hadn't gained enough experience or qualification to really do at that point. The timing of that, it was the day before Christmas Eve, so a lot of the experienced people were off 
taken care of getting their vacation done before the end of the year, attaching it to the Christmas holiday and such. But the customer needed this equipment repaired and hurry. So however, you know, things evolved, he was called out to work on that equipment. And again, as I said, he wasn't experienced or qualified really to handle that yet. And he was working on it. And unfortunately, uh, a part of the, the equipment that he was working on when he released some uh, a hydraulic hose, as I recollect, uh, came down on top of him and trapped him. Now, again, being at this point in time, the place where he was doing this work was also pretty, you know, partially shut down. So there weren't a lot of people in the building. And he was in the back of the warehouse, so nobody basically heard him or knew what was going on. And he may have laid there dying for some time before, unfortunately, he did. So then in these tragic instances, you know, we have to try to take a look at what happened. Because unfortunately, in this case, the young man couldn't tell us what went wrong. So we kind of try to retrace the steps of that person's last few hours on earth. It's pretty chilling because seeing, you know what's going to happen, but you're trying to trace exactly what occurred. And as well, these investigations take some time and you get to talk to their co-workers and you get to know the person or who he or she was. In this case, this young man had a uh, three-year-old and a nine-month-old, two children, a daughter and a son. And unfortunately, now they're never going to know who their father was. And as this thing progresses and you find out, you know, or you draw the the report together to, to see exactly what happened, In this case, very, very matter-of-factly, I can say, had the employer been OSHA compliant on a particular program, on a particular standard, this young man probably would be alive today. In this case, pretty clear-cut that and the company was very apologetic. They knew that they needed to be doing more, but it kept kind of getting pushed off for other things that had to be running the business and such. And unfortunately, every so often, that can come back to haunt an employer if they're not making sure they keep their safety program in good shape. It's hard not to get emotional listening to a story like that. But just based on what you were talking about, had this one box on the OSHA compliance checklist been checked, maybe he's still around. They had a few additional people, but in the machine shop that day or wherever he was working, maybe he'd still be around. Absolutely. I mean, that, and unfortunately, Paul, I've had a number of investigations that I've had to do where people have lost their lives. And there is a common thread throughout all of them. Most often is a safety, something that was supposed to be given the attention it should have been given, a safety rule, regulation. Again, I can go back to saying, you know, OSHA compliance, that I can fairly say that had that been there, that employee may not have suffered the, the fatal injury. On a personal note, how do you deal with that? Well, you know, you said it, it's avoidable. There's only, in fact, one case that I can think of a fatality where we could not figure out what happened. It was just impossible. But in each case, again, as I talk about reliving the lives of the individual, that can be pretty, again, I think I said chilling. You see at various points, it's kind of an, it goes back to what they call uh, the domino theory in, in accident investigation or safety, where the, the stage is being set very methodically on how an individual may be seriously hurt or worse, and lack of training. Uh, we don't have a program up to date. We're not doing a safety inspection and on that basically sets the stage for an accident to occur. I'm the type that does get, I guess you could say, kind of wrapped up. Just as you said, when you think of these things, you start thinking about your kids. And I think about that young man that was 25. And I think even back to myself and think, you know, at 25 years old, I think I was 27 when my first daughter was born. You know, and I think I was 29 or 30 when my uh, second was born. So if I had kicked the bucket at 25, uh, I would, those kids wouldn't be alive today doing the great things that they're doing and enjoying life and not to leave my wife out of the equation either. 
and you try to take a good look at it. And the motivation is when you do these things, just like we have terrible tragedies, a plane crash or things like that, the motivation of these people is we want to find out exactly what happened so it doesn't happen again. It's already too late, unfortunately, for those people, but almost a recognition of those people to say, you know what, we're going to make sure something like this doesn't happen to you. And it's a lesson I've learned many, many times over the course of my career. Well, I hope based on this conversation, I hope several things come of this. One, I hope there's more of a conscientiousness now with safety. And I think, Ron, based on this conversation, we've certainly put that on the forefront. Two, I hope people continue to prioritize safety because we're not talking about dollars, we're talking about lives. Isn't it pretty cool to think about all the lives you did save based on your hard work and efforts? Yeah, you know, I guess it goes back to, you know, my fascination with time, place, and circumstance to say that I have many occasions in the past when we found something, a hazard, for example, that we've discussed in a, a safety team meeting or something like that, or somebody saw something and we knew right away how dangerous that was and it was corrected before it had a chance to hurt somebody. So those things, you start, it gives you a pause, I guess, uh, to think about that. And I really, yeah, I would really like to believe that maybe some of the work that I've done and the good people I've worked with, maybe some mom and dads around there today or some son or daughter because of you know, something we caught uh, before it was too late. Well, speaking for myself as host of the Beyond the Known podcast, this has been a truly inspirational conversation. You've definitely given me something to think about. You've readjusted my perspective on a couple of things. And I think I'm going to cover myself in bubble wrap from head to toe right now just to make sure that nothing happens to me here throughout the rest of the day. But our listeners might not know this, but you're a published author. You've published a couple of books that are out there somewhere. So, Well, I've always had a, an interest in writing. And as part of my job, you know, working in the insurance industry, and even to this day, there's uh, some of the work that I do, I have to do an awful lot of writing. You know, I'll have three, four, five, eight-page reports that I have to do. And I just decided I wanted to go in a different direction, and I wrote a book actually about how to build a safety culture. And I kind of took a look at that both from a, an analytical or, mechan I guess I could say mechanical standpoint, and a human standpoint, because in fact, that is one question that I get a lot today and from star clients. They're interested in how to improve their safety culture, their environment. As important as things like OSHA compliance are today, there are a lot of companies that have come a long way to become OSHA compliant, which is great, and others that still need uh, considerable assistance. So I decided, and this is over 10 years ago now, to put a book together and following again, like I said earlier, somewhat giving the reader some kind of a path to follow in terms of helping build a safety culture. The other book is a novel and that's a, an entirely different story, Paul. Well, I'm not letting you off the hook that easy, especially <laughs> now that you piqued my curiosity. Can you just give me some idea of what kind of a novel this is? A novel that's uh, kind of got a paranormal twist to it Based on, actually, it's a long story, but I had a dear friend that I knew that I worked with for many years, and he was younger than me and passed away suddenly, and I kind of started to have dreams about him. I don't know why. I don't know if it was like kind of post-traumatic traumatic stress or something of that sort, but, and this is just one part of the puzzle on writing the novel, but anyway, how that experience kind of expanded is... I brought that into the book, although with, in this case, a uh, what I call a paranormal soulmate to the main character in the book. And this takes place in the, uh, between the uh, end of World War II and the beginning of the Vietnam War. And then, of course, I throw in some fiction. There's people in the book that are actually real people, my father actually being one of them. In fact, the this little discussion I gave you about his draft deferment and what he did during the war. That's written into the book as part of the plot, if you will. And probably the main thing, you know, not to make this a real long story, but I've always been fascinated by time, 
place and circumstance. And you think about how we get up and we do things every day, and we may pick up the keys off the table and go off to work. And think about if we left a little bit earlier or a little bit later than we did, what events could happen that could change our lives or the lives of somebody else radically or forever? What kind of gets into that a little bit? So I don't know how much more you want to hear about it, Paul, but Well, I'm going to have to tell you, we're going to have to have you back on a different episode of Beyond the Known because I've myself have been somewhat fascinated by that. But anyway, it's about a young man and a good buddy of his that grow up between the end of World War II and the beginning of Vietnam. And there's this girl that the main character in the book keeps uh, seeing in his dreams. And he kind of refuses to believe that there could be anything to that. Meanwhile, he's trying to lead a normal life. And he gets into, of course, with his buddy and such, some of the attractions of the era, like actually I had what we call a muscle car era, where, you know, cars were made very powerful right from the factory. Uh, And that all kind of blended into it. And I, I kind of lived that experience for a few years of my life. So that's written in there as well. But I'll tell you what, there hasn't been much success with my writing. <laughs> well, but now you're on the Beyond the Known podcast. And with our uh, fervent audience, hopefully that's going to change. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a conversation with Ron Humphreys. Once again, he's the owner of Employee Risk Management Specialists. He's one of the finest safety consultants around. It is a true blessing to have him as a risk reduction service for our clients here at the Star Group. Ron, this was a powerful conversation, and I'm most appreciative of your insight here today. Well, I'm really glad to be able to discuss this with you, Paul. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Known with Paul M. Newberger. If you like our show and want to know more, check us out at stargroup.com. That's S-T-A-R-R group.com slash podcast. We're also available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.